So we know now that uh, the reaction rate is very dependent on temperature and that our re uh, re rate law constant K does vary indeed with temperature. And as you see here, most reaction rates increase with a temperature increase. And there's kind of an approximate rule that a reaction rate doubles for each 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature. Not every reaction follows that rule, but it's a good approximate rule to think about. Why this happens can be explained in through two different theories, collision theory and the transition state theory. So for collision theory, what it's basically saying is that in order for a reaction to occur, reactant molecules, they must collide with a certain amount of energy, a minimum required energy that we call the activation energy, symbolized E sub A. And this is the energy, the minimum energy that's required of the collision and these molecules must collide with the proper orientation. So what we end up having is, in collision theory, K is equal to ZFP. Looks like fun, right? Of course. Z is the collision frequency. How frequently are these molecules colliding? F is the fraction of the collisions that have the required activation energy that's needed and P is the fraction of collisions that have the proper required orientation. And so let's dissect this a little further. So again, in collision theory, K equals ZFP. So here we have a reaction, nitrogen monoxide reacting with chlorine. For Z, as our temperature rises, molecules move faster and they collide more often. And we can remember back when we talked about this with the kinetic theory of gases. The root molecular speed of a gas was given by this equation, the square root of 3RT over molar mass. And long story short, a 10 degree temperature rise will increase the Z about 2%. But we just said that it's about 10%. And so, I'm sorry, that it doubles with 10 percent with a 10 degree sorry doubles for each 10 degree rise in temperature so this two percent doesn't cover it all so why does the reaction rate increase so much more and the answer lies in f so let's look at f a little bit closer now all right so f ends up having this funky little equation that it is equal to e which is used with our natural log, to the negative Ea, activation energy, divided by Rt. R is our gas law constant, and T would be the temperature in Kelvin. We really don't do any plug and chug uh, math with this, but it's just more so to explain. And as you see here, F changes much more dramatically with an increase in temperature. So the increase in reaction rate is explained by the temperature dependence of F. All right, so Z, yes, there was a small effect. F is where the dramatic effect takes place. So this little variable F decreases as the activation of energy increases. So if we have a reaction with a very large activation energy, it will have a small rate constant. If there's a small energy of activation, we will have a large rate constant. So you might be asked something about looking at a particular reaction rate constant, and if one is larger than the other, how that reflects in the activation energy. That's a potential type question. But again, I don't believe we'll see any kind of plug and chugs with that, as we'll see here in a, in a minute. Now the P factor, again, is the orientation. And this is completely independent of temperature. If molecules do not collide in a very specific location on their surface, then they're just going to bounce apart and no reaction is going to occur. So here you see a little visual. If A and B, C are going to react, and if they collide in the proper orientation, then we would end up having a positive result. We would have see the reaction occur. If they collide inappropriately, then no reaction occurs because the orientation is correct. So again, this is independent of temperature, but it's definitely a, an important factor as far as the collision theory is concerned. 
So collision theory does an excellent job explaining a lot of important features of a reaction, but it doesn't do a great job explaining the role of the activation energy. It just says, you know, we need a minimum amount of energy. And that's where our transition state theory comes in. It's going to explain a reaction that results from the collision of two molecules in terms of an activated complex, also known as a transition state. And what this is, it's an unstable grouping of atoms that can break up to form products. It can also break apart and go back to being reactants, but it may form products. So if I look at this little diagram, here I see a fruitful collision. And so when A and B molecules collide, I end up having this activated complex, this transition state, an unstable situation. And then it may bust up and become my two products. It could also go back to being reactants. All right, but at least we will see formation of products potentially. Unlike down here, when we have the unfruitful collision. And even though they collide, they collide in the improper orientation. And so they'll simply bounce apart. So when I look at this transition state theory, I see that, well, let me just say, when we're looking at the collisions and the orientations, one way they like to say it is that there's a very specific location on the surface of the molecules that must be colliding appropriately. So again, talking about very specific locations on the surface of molecules. That's one way they like to explain orientation. So here's that reaction again, nitrogen monoxide reacting with chlorine. So here's my reactants. And when they collide, they create this activated complex. And it's often depicted with dashed lines in between, meaning there are bonds that are potentially forming between the N and Cl. And there's also bonds that are potentially falling apart, like the bond between the chlorine and chlorine. And so again, my activated complex may go forward and form my products, but it may also go backwards and go back to being reactants. Okay. Now what this looks like in a diagram form, here we see the uh, reaction pathway. And this actual example is an endothermic reaction. So this is the typical diagram of an endothermic reaction. And so what we see, and, and these are called the potential energy diagrams for reactions. So what we see is that my reactants are down here at a specific amount of energy, potential energy in kilojoules. My products are over here. So my products have more energy. So that's why this is endothermic. Energy is going into the reaction. And I can see the path that this reaction is going to take. So I have to put energy in. And then once I put enough energy in, then I can create my activated complex. And then that activated complex can break apart and come and form products. If I don't put enough energy in, then the reactants will simply collide and come back down and won't be able to go to being products. So that large hill is known as the activation energy. And you can see that right here. The activation energy is the amount of energy from the reactants to the activated complex on this diagram. Then the difference between my reactant energy and my product's energy, of course, from back in the day, is my delta H, the change in enthalpy for this reaction. And this, of course, would be a positive delta H because it's endothermic. Some specific numbers I could use with this specific reaction. The activation energy for this reaction ends up being 85 kilojoules. And that, of course, is per mole. And the delta H ends up being 83 kilojoules per mole. So not a big difference. And so right here, 
there's a small difference of two kilojoules per mole. And what we can do is we can also look at this diagram backwards. So if I had my products and I wanted to go back to the reactants, that's a very small activation energy. So the reverse activation energy would be two kilojoules, much, much smaller than the forward activation energy. And that's typical of an endothermic reaction. The reverse would have a smaller activation energy than the forward. Now, if we're looking at an exothermic reaction, OK, and here's just your typical diagram. Again, you see reactants with a certain amount of energy, products with a certain amount of energy, potential energy. And my reaction path, again, I have to put in enough energy, that energy of activation. And once I'm at the top of the hill, I see my transition state, my activated complex. And then I proceed down to my products when I have put in enough energy. And this, again, is exothermic. And so my delta H for the reaction will be a negative value. And if you look at this reverse, the activation energy reverse is huge compared to the activation, activation energy for the forward reaction. So again, transition state theory and um, the collision theory is just explaining why that reaction rate is affected by temperature. These potential energy diagrams are pretty common as far as, again, there's my exothermic version and an endothermic version. And it's just trying to explain on the molecular level what is going on, why we see, indeed, the activation energy, or the, I'm sorry, the reaction rate increasing with a temperature increase. We can tie it all together with this Arrhenius equation. And this, we see Mr. Arrhenius a couple different times in our class. But it summarizes the temperature dependence of the rate of reaction in terms of activation energy. And so for collision theory, we saw that K equals ZFP. So here, A ends up lumping together Z and P. And then this is what we saw as being F before. And so calculations involving the Arrhenius equation are beyond the scope of the AP exam. And so, yes, we can do our little happy dance because we don't have to worry about plug and chug calculations involving this equation. But it can be used, like I said, to ask you some thoughtful questions about reaction rates and how temperature and activation energy are kind of linked together. All right. See you soon.